Okay, so last night I gave this same homily, and I built it up with a big introduction about the love of God and the relationship that he desires with us and how we're made for intimacy and all these things, and everyone's just looking at me, smiling and nodding. And then at one point, pulled a 180 and told them what I really wanted to talk about, and everyone's faces just dropped. And so, uh, I don't know, I felt like a father, like, driving his kids at night. It's like, is everybody hungry? And everyone's all excited, like, yeah. And then you see the golden arches of McDonald's coming up. You're getting closer and closer, and then all of a sudden, I take a hard ride into a cemetery and be like, great, because tonight we're going to fast for the souls in purgatory and go pray for them. <laughs> You're like, what the hell? <laughs> exactly. That's what we're going to talk about today. Hell, yes. But I still want my McDonald's introduction, so we're going to go with that still. So many things in life are defined by boundaries, right? Not, the, not just the area that we possess, but everything that's around it. When you have your own house, your own lawn, like that is yours, but it's also very much defined by everything that is not yours around that. In relationships, you get a specific relationship with your spouse that you don't get with anybody else in this world. And that's very beautiful in itself. But there's a lot of chaos that happens if we ever go outside of that relationship, right? Games. All games are run according to rules. And it's only when everybody follows those same rules that you can actually interact and play that game together. You lose the rules and you lose the game. Same thing with traffic laws, right? All the traffic laws are there so that we can all drive in the same way without getting into chaos. And once somebody goes outside those laws, right, it can lead to great destruction. That's why I never put any Catholic insignia on my truck because the last thing I want is people thinking I'm a Catholic priest when I'm driving because I don't always follow the laws of the road. <laughs> but it's also true, especially with art. And one of my favorite um, artists is Caravaggio. And one thing that artists know is that it's not about the central image of what you want to portray. It's about everything that you put around that image that actually has the power to draw the eyes to what you want them to notice. So with Caravaggio, he has, if you like, look at the St. Paul falling off his horse. We're celebrating St. Paul's conversion this Thursday, so you can even see it on our weekly updates. It's really beautiful because you see him falling down from the, from the horse, and he's just at the bottom. He's covered in light, but there's this huge horse behind him, and everything else is black. And the reason it's that way is that it draws the vision, all that darkness around him draws the eyes to St. Paul as the central figure. So boundaries are not just about what is right in front of us, what we have, but it's, it's very much determined by everything outside of that. And the most important, the most central reality of our faith, what we should be continually meditating upon, trying to grow in, learn about, is the love of God that has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ through His incarnation, that God became man to be with us. His preaching and His teaching and His healing. That's our daily bread. Intimacy with Him in the Holy Eucharist, where He abides with us. And gazing at the cross, especially in our times of suffering, to realize there's nothing we could ever go through that Jesus Christ isn't there with us. That's what we should be thinking about all the time. That love manifested in Christ is the magnificent portrait God painted for us. It's the love. That love is the road we're meant to travel through this life. It's the lover's game. All men are, all are meant to play. And every rule associated with that relationship is meant to protect the sacredness of the bond and the covenant that we have been invited into. However, now that we get to the cemetery part, here's the rub. That revelation of love loses its contrast, its boundaries, its very purpose. If we do not appreciate the reality of hell that surrounds that magnificent image that Christ himself paints us of our salvation. Without hell, the incarnation is a mere appendix upon reality rather than its beating heart. 
Without hell, Christ's words and commandments, they're reduced to mere niceties to make us feel good when we're down. Without hell, His cross is stripped of its perfect, of His purpose, and His blood is watered down with no real power or need to cleanse us. Without hell, the gospel is emptied of its meaning. Without hell, there is no true game to be played or reason to follow the rules. Without hell, there is no incentive to even enter the arena to do battle with our sins and with the demons that are constantly at war with us. Without hell, the good news of the gospel becomes bad news an unnecessary interruption to an otherwise convenient life without Christ. Why go through the suffering and strife of conversion if in the end it's all the same for everybody? What's the point of repentance? It reminds me of a joke. It feels like a moment we could have a joke, right? So, but in, in, there's a joke that says, in, omnen, in omnes mendacium semen veritatis. In every joke, there is a seed of truth. So there was once a Jesuit who hundreds of years ago traveled to Alaska to convert the pagans. You can think of like Isaiah's great, great, great grandfather in that time. And this Jesuit found this chief of a tribe living in Alaska, and this man had multiple wives, because polygamy was just the norm of wherever you go. He worshipped the salmon god along with Sam Hyde. He was continually at war with the tribes around him. He enslaved women and children and killed any man who crossed his path. And this Jesuit, he came and he preached the gospel to him. He said, repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Accept the gospel. Turn away from your sins. Live in the truth. And you too, can experience internal salvation in Jesus Christ. And this chieftain, he, w- he didn't have too far off till his own death, so he was intrigued. So he asked, what must I do to, to follow this Jesus? And he says, well, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to be baptized. You have to convert your life to his teachings. You have to go to Mass on Sundays. You have to swear not to, to fight against all your sins and go to confession when you fall. You can only have one wife, and she must be for life. You have to live in the truth. And by the way, you can't watch pornography either. And if you do all these things, then you can go to heaven. And the chief thought about this for a moment. And then he asked a question. If you had not come here and preached this Jesus Christ to me, and I didn't follow him, when I died, would I still go to heaven? Jesuit thought about this for a minute and said, well, you know, we do believe in a very merciful God. So yeah, probably you'd still go to heaven. And the chieftain threw up his arms and said, well, why the hell did you come out here? Right? It's a good question. If we don't need the Gospel, if we don't need Jesus Christ to get to heaven, why preach it in the first place? Pope Benedict spoke about this in an experience. He heard another fellow bishop one time say, I'm glad that we haven't preached the gospel to these Pacific Islanders because the way they live their life, the gospel demands of Christ would be too much for them to live up to. So it's better to just leave them in ignorance and hope that they're saved. And Pope Benedict, reflecting on that, said, isn't that interesting that when we take away the possibility of eternal perdition, the good news of salvation actually becomes bad news. An unnecessary burden on people's lives to convert and turn their lives to Jesus Christ. It's like telling somebody, if you, don't get the, you have to get this surgery in order to get better. They say, well, is there any other way? You're like, well, you could just not get the surgery. It'll be the same. You'll be fine. It's like, okay, why go through the surgery? Why go through the pain of conversion? The good news of salvation only makes sense with the possibility of perdition. That's why I think the greatest, the most efficacious heresy of our times is the belief of universal salvation. 
And I don't believe it's the greatest heresy because I don't want, because I want everyone to go to hell. No one should, we, no one should think anybody's in hell. No one should want anybody in hell. But we need to understand that when we don't preach the full, or believe the full gospel, when we lose sight of Christ's warnings about the reality of hell, look at what has happened in the last hundred years of Catholicism. I have never in my life met one person who walked away from the church who at the same time said they believe in hell, sin, and the devil and eternal consequences. When we take away the consequences for saying no to Jesus Christ, we take away one of the most powerful incentives that He Himself gave us to keep us faithful. When we, have, we lose understanding of what it means to be a human, we as human beings are not motivated by good as much as by the negative on the whole. So they did tests with mice, right? Where a, a mouse was connected to a cord, a string a, like a, it could stretch, and it was trying to get after some cheese. And so they wanted to measure how much force it, brought, it, it carried against that string, right? At one point, they sprayed um, cat odor behind the mouse. It pulled that string twice as hard as it was before with just the incentive for the cheese. And that's how we are as human beings too. And if we lose the reality of the revelation of what Jesus Christ taught us about the fear of hell, we are not going to strive for heaven with the ardor that is necessary, perhaps, to save our souls. And it's not a matter of opinion. I'm always amused when people ask me as a priest, what is your opinion on hell? The first word that comes to my mind every time is musicals. I don't think that's what they were talking about. I can't stand musicals. But La La Land, Les Mis, that's, that's more like perdition. Along, I mean, uh, purgatory along the way. But most of the time, other eyes, that's eternal perdition for me. But why ask me? I've never been there, and I'm not the Lord. My only opinion on the subject is what Jesus Christ himself taught us. And Jesus, he has, he has this really beautiful narr narrative with uh, Nicodemus. If you read John chapter 3 today, at some point, and he's explaining to him about heaven and hell. And Nicodemus is questioning him. He says, Truly I tell you, we speak of you what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Only Jesus has the authority to teach us about what happens after we die, because only Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, came into this world to show us how we get to heaven. And Jesus spoke of hell more than he spoke of heaven. And Jesus told us that more people are on the road to perdition than on the road to salvation. And Jesus told us that if there's anything in our life separating us from our eternal salvation, it would be better to cut off our own hand than to have our whole body thrown in Gehenna. And what he meant like by that was that there should be nothing that we're not willing to sacrifice in order to save our souls. But again, the question, if there is no hell, why make the sacrifice to get to heaven? And that's what happens when we do not believe the testimony that Jesus Christ himself gave us. One last image. There's this movie called Concussion. And it was, it's based on a real story about a doctor who worked in the NFL. And he noticed that all the players were like two concussions away from permanent brain damage. And he found out that all the other doctors around knew about these things, but they weren't warning the players. Because these doctors were said to be, um, they said, the guys, this is all they have, let them play until they're dead. Because what else is after that? And this one doctor who stood up and said, we need to warn them, we need to give them the choice, we need to let them know the danger that they're in, he was persecuted by everybody else around. But ask, ask the question, who was more merciful and loving? The doctors who said, just keep going, playing along, knowing that there's consequences? Or the ones who gave the warning? 
The prophets are the ones, like Jonah, who time and time again come out and preach a gospel of repentance. And God's mercy that He gives us is a response to our repentance. A response to His gospel of do I change my life, amend my ways, and follow Him with everything I am as He demands? Or do I continue going my own way? But without the prophets to preach, without the incarnation of Christ to come, we are all walking in darkness with no other road to turn to. And I will say this, if you are a practicing Catholic, that you're coming to Mass on a regular basis, you're spending time in adoration, you're already going to confession regularly, you don't need to think about hell. I almost never think about hell. Maybe I should do it a little bit more myself. But there comes a time where perfect love casts out all fear. And once you're really directed towards God, and He's the most important thing in your life, hell won't serve you. And it can actually be a great temptation of the evil one to push people into despair. But on the other hand, if I am struggling with sin and the temptations of this world, and I don't know if I'm really convinced about the teachings of Christ, it would do me very good to look at the full portrait of salvation. Not just the image of Paul on the ground, but, but also all that darkness around that draws the image to the mercy. We need to ask ourselves, do we really believe everything that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, taught us? Do I act as if hell is real in my own life? Flannery O'Connor once said, a famous convert and author, before she became Catholic, she asked one of her Catholic friends about the Eucharist. And her friend said, you know, to me it's, it's just a symbol. It's a nice gesture of Christ, but it's not the real, the real presence. And Flannery O'Connor responded to her, if it's just a symbol, to hell with it means nothing. That's why St. Paul says we must be in a state of grace. That we'll, we must examine ourselves, our lives, before receiving Holy Communion. Or else, St. Paul tells us in Corinthians, we eat and drink condemnation upon ourselves. If we have not gone through worthy confession and amended our ways before receiving the Eucharist, See, the more intimate God reveals Himself to us, the bigger the condemnation surrounds that invitation of intimacy in the same way that a married couple have the deepest intimacy with one another in their life. But because of that very intimacy, there's a greater judgment that comes around those vows of fidelity to one another. The Eucharist is either Jesus Christ or to hell with it. Jesus' gospel actually has the unique power to save our souls or to hell with it. And if it is true, everything He Himself told us, how we respond to His call to repent and believe in the gospel actually matters for our salvation or to hell with us.